Welcome to CTG Talk, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with influential practitioners and thought leaders to explore the governance challenges raised by emerging approaches to alter the climate. I'm Mark Turner, Senior Communications Consultant with CTG, and I'm speaking today with Sunita Narayan, who is the Director General of the India-based research and advocacy organisation, the Centre for Science and Environment, and is also the editor of its fortnightly magazine, Down to Earth. Ms. Narayan is an influential voice in India, but her work on climate justice and sustainable development has also gained international attention, not least including in Leonardo DiCaprio's documentary Before the Flood. In 2016, she was named to Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people. Welcome, Sunita Narayan, to CTG Talk. Thank you, Mark. Happy to be with you. Thank you. So the world faces many interlocking crises, continued poverty, climate change, the pandemic, food insecurity. Yet the ability of governments to tackle these crises collaboratively at a global level is increasingly under strain. You have in your recent writings warned of a growing polarization exacerbated by misinformation and mistrust. How would you describe the geopolitical moment we are living through right now? You know, Mark, uh, I think we should really be worried because this is possibly the worst time for us to be discussing a serious issue like climate change in the world. The fact is climate change requires governments to work together. It requires countries to put aside their differences and to collaborate. And it is very clear that a global existential issue like climate change requires us to understand interdependence of our societies, of our nations as never before. And yet it is today a time when the world is even more divided between us and them, between the, the distra I mean, between a war which is horrific, which has led to huge uh, problems um, uh, across the world, but more than that is really putting the world into these different camps of who is with whom. And frankly, this, these boundaries, these borders are not good for climate change. We require a world that is going to talk to each other, which is going to negotiate as equals between the poorest and the richest countries. Because let's be very clear, climate change is a great equalizer and that we have to work together. I mean, the, this is one issue on which the rich cannot bully the poor. And it is also one issue on which the poor cannot not cooperate. So we need both sides. And really, it's a, it's, it's, it's a tough time in the world. And you know, I, I don't know what else to say to you other than to say that as somebody who has been campaigning on climate change for the last three decades, I have never seen the impacts of climate change as horrific as they are today. And Yet, our government's so distracted that they are not taking the necessary action at the scale and pace that is required. So, how are you tackling? Obviously, there's limits to what any one actor can do, but how are you tackling this polarization and uh, challenge to collaboration in your work? Well, it's almost impossible for us to tackle the issue of global polarization other than to point out to it and to say, this does not make for a better world. And um, for us to point out that the situation is urgent, that the impacts are, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you look at my own country of India, we are seeing such uh, huge impacts on the very poor of India because of the events, because of extreme uh, weather events that are unfolding in our world. Uh, from extreme rainfall events, which are leading to floods, to the fact that we are getting um, extreme, um, 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 uh, you're getting drought, prolonged drought periods, you're getting very, very high levels of heat wave. You're getting, you're essentially getting into a situation which is, as I call, the revenge of nature. And governments still don't seem to understand that this revenge of nature is a call that we have to respond to, that we cannot have the arrogance or the 
hubris to think that we'll be able to ride this out. So the IPCC recently issued a rather alarming warning that the world is almost certainly going to overshoot the 1.5 degrees warming goal with obviously increasingly severe consequences for people around the world, especially the most vulnerable. Do you think there's still any chance of uh, keeping warming below 1.5, keep 1.5 alive as uh, one expression goes, or alternatively, are you thinking about the consequences of an overshoot, both you know, to human well-being, ecosystems, the economy, but also political and psychological? What does it mean to go over that 1.5 degree goal? Mark, I'll be blunt with you. I think the world was fooling itself. It was delusional. I think we were on an overshoot the minute we signed the Paris Agreement, because the Paris Agreement was an agreement which said, we'll do as much as we can, whatever is convenient. There was no target set for each country based on its responsibility. Global rules were given a short shift when it came to saying how much is a country's contribution to the climate change problem and therefore how much should a country have a target to cut. It was an agreement that was built on uh, the notion of saying we will do our best and we will try and ratchet up that action over time. Now, I mean, that was a agreement designed, I think in 2015 itself, we knew that the world would overshoot 1.5 degrees, but it is delusional, I mean, uh, to be able to keep thinking. And I think that's where IPCC, I think has failed us all because IPCC should have pointed out to this, but they always say they are scientists and therefore politics is not their business but they needed to have pointed out to the fact that the global carbon budget was so shrunk now that unless there was a fair allocation of that budget, the world would overshoot the 1.5 degrees centigrade. And I think that's where science has failed humanity and IPCC should be in the dock for not being able to speak truth to power. So in terms of the consequences political, as it were, of the overshoot. From what you're suggesting, perhaps there was already an understanding that there would be an overshoot. So the actual consequence of the overshoot might not be as large as, as one might expect. I, 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 I'm interested in your thoughts. Do, what does, is there a moment at which you overshoot 1.5 that this has an impact on the way the world thinks about I think the world problem? will just, just move the, um, I mean, please understand, there has never been a logic for 1.5 or two degrees, okay? And we all know that. So I think 1.5, they will say was aspirational. And now of course it's a two degree target. And then we, when we overshoot two degrees, it'll be a 2.5 degree target. And we need to know that this is a target which is designed to take us all to hell. Uh, we, are already, we are only at 1.1 degree centigrade rise from um, um, 1850, 1870, when the records are kept. Um, we know that on an average in terms of global temperature rise. Um, and yet you and I are talking today of devastations in the rich countries and the poor countries like never before. And that's only at 1.1 degree. So let's be clear, as each degree increases, um, it's going to get worse and much worse. So, uh, but I think the world, because we didn't, we, we knew we would shoot 1.5 degrees, but it was convenient to have a narrative mm -hmm. because the rich and the developed countries needed to have more and more, didn't want the responsibility to shift to their end, to take the drastic reductions. But now we are going to overshoot that and there's going to be a budget which is already very, very tight. So let's be clear about this, Mark. Things are going to get only worse. And I'm not sure whether we understand what adaptation to climate change can even be and how we are going to cope with the consequences. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll definitely come back to that, that later. Maybe just one last question about the 1.5 goal. Um, there was always this understanding with the concept of overshoot, whether or not you know, you would agree with it or not, that you overshoot and then bring it back down again. And that the <laughs> challenge is to do that overshoot for the least amount possible, every 10th of a degree matters, and for the shortest amount of time 
possible. Um, do you think that the 1.5 still has some meaning in the sense of, well, we now just need to bring it down as quickly as possible? Mark, I think some more wiser people need to give an answer to that. I cannot understand right. how. When you have filled an atmosphere with carbon dioxide, which has a life of 150 years, how you're going to absorb that and what kind of trees are you going to plant? What kind of you know, sequestration are you going to do to be able to get that carbon dioxide, which is a long life gas yes. um, out of the atmosphere? You can definitely say we can overshoot 1.5 degrees, but then maybe we can, if we are wise enough, we'll be able to reduce drastically to reduce our emissions so that we don't add further to the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But how we are going to remove those gases from the atmosphere after we've overshot 1.5 degrees, I think is really about uh, more theory than science. That, that, that's interesting. And that is, in fact, something I definitely wanted to move to. So there are you know, different approaches uh, to carbon dioxide removal suggested, um, a variety of nature-based approaches uh, and also technological approaches. Um, and yes, obviously the idea is first that these might be helpful in achieving net zero to offset which is now a word under increasing scrutiny, um, tough residual emissions, but also maybe to go ne negative uh, to bring down the total atmospheric CO2 concentrations. I mean, you've already shared some thoughts of it, but I wonder if you could go a little further. I mean, what awareness do you see amongst your audiences and interlocutors of this aspect of climate action that's getting increasing attention uh, in, in, in various countries and in the IPCC or carbon dioxide removal? What understanding is there of the challenges of the different approaches and technologies, who might pay for it and, and, and so forth? Very good question, Mark. I mean, the only area in which I would have any idea or any information to share with you or perspective to share with you is really what is broadly called nature-based solutions. And um, where, uh, there is, of course, this grand plan, and a lot of people have jumped onto it to say, let's plant trees as a way to be able to sequester carbon dioxide. Now, to me, planting trees is a win-win, no question about it, okay? But planting trees which are in the hands of the very poor are a win-win. Planting trees so that the livelihood of very poor communities benefits from the planting of those trees is a win-win which also means that they need the right to be able to both plant the trees and to cut the trees. They need to be able to plant trees which are useful for their economies and not to plant trees just as carbon sticks. Right. Okay. Now, uh, there's also the fact that there is some amount of, uh, um, they, they, I, I have been looking at the science of uh, carbon removal by mm -hmm. nature with solutions. And there is a huge uh, um, gap in terms of exactly how would you account for this. And the difference is also in estimates from the different methodologies used for, using, uh, for calculating or estimating the, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the potential of uh, um, trees to be sinks. And um, I mean, when I look at those estimations and the order of magnitude um, by which they differ, it's a lot to do with just how you will plan to, to, um, to include the role of uh, 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 trees and, for, and grasslands and land as uh, potential for um, uh, mitigating and removal of carbon dioxide. So my view, Mark, would be a little different. My mm -hmm. view would be, we definitely need to invest in nature-based solutions. I have no doubt about that. But we need to make sure that the politics of nature-based solution is not focused on the, um, just the removal of carbon dioxide, but the yes. fact that we need to build these as livelihood and resilience options for the communities who are going to be worst impacted by the by climate change yes. and if we can do this we actually and we improve the accounting systems um, so that we can transfer good money and real money into the hands of the poor communities you have a chance to be able to if not mitigate the problem at least to be able to find ways 
of using nature to work for nature. Right. And I think that would be a very powerful tool. But then, as you very rightly asked, is the question is financial, because if I look at the cost of um, uh, why, are, why is nature-based solution becoming so uh, prominent in the mitigation options and in net zero is because everybody thinks that there is huge amount of land available in countries of the developing world, whether it's Africa, India, and where it'll, you can plant trees at negative cost or at minimal cost. And you look at the ranges coming out of Europe, which says it's going to be so expensive to plant trees, but you can do that in Africa. But right. that African land belongs to somebody. It belongs to some community. They need to get a livelihood security for the use of that land. They need to benefit from it. So I think, Mark, we're not putting our money where our mouth is. We're not serious about climate change. When we come to these newfangled words, we pick up because at the end of the day, uh, let's, I'm old enough to tell you that nature-based solution was called red earlier right. and then red, and before that red, red and then red plus. And there was always this talk about uh, using trees and uh, forests and land and, and others to be able to improve the resilience of um, the planet. But I think we've never been serious about it. And now that the, uh, now that things are so dire, we're just clutching at straws. We're still not serious about using what could be a viable solution and make yes. it work for the planet, for climate change and for people. So there's been a lot of focus recently on the idea of greenwashing, whereby companies uh, absolve their emissions sins, so to speak, by paying for a project which may or may not have happened anyway, or by yeah. paying for some trees not to be chopped down, which may or may not have been chopped down anyway. Um, how, what's your feeling around that whole debate now? There's so much focus on, on this idea of greenwashing and accounting and verifying and how on earth do you actually um, go about creating the system that, 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 that properly monitors and verifies and so forth. Do you have any thoughts on, on what needs to be done there and to what extent the international community, given the problems that we've, we've uh, addressed earlier, uh, is able to actually create that system? I think, Mark, we need to turn this on the head, on its head. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact is, today, when I look at the rules that are being set up for uh, uh, measurement of, uh, um, of uh, carbon sequestration, they're so complicated that actually you would need a team of the most uh, advanced auditors who would then require auditors to audit their work exactly as we did in CDM. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a scam. Uh, so I think what we need is much simpler rules. You need mm -hmm. to make sure that you can put real money in the hands of uh, people, communities, and you need to find measurement tools which are, which are easy to, to use, whether it is satellite-based measurement, whether it is uh, um, uh, financial measurements, and those can easily be done. I mean, all our countries have afforestation programs today and have um, the same challenges and are looking at ways to be able to measure the survival rate of trees and, um, and making sure that those trees are actually used uh, for community welfare. Because at the end of the day, we will need to plant trees and we will need to cut the trees mm -hmm. and we will need to replant the trees. So we also need to understand that you're not doing this as tree planting in perpetuity because uh, that actually will not work as well as we want for carbon sequestration and will not certainly work for the people who, whose lands these trees will be planted. Do you have any thoughts on um, the technological solutions that are now being uh, looked at, direct air capture plants or some of the hybrids like bioenergy with carbon capture and storage? Do you have any thoughts on those approaches? Well, I mean, I think um, uh, what I understand for verification of tree planting, there's a lot of satellite-based tools mm -hmm. that are coming up. Then, of course, there's the more complicated work that you're talking about is what happens with bioenergy. What happens to the trees you plant and then use them to, 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 to run energy plants with? Uh, what kind of measurement do you do? You know, and that's where Europe has been on this very slippery slope of uh, using bioenergy and double counting 
um, it's, um, it's, um, uh, it's carbon sequestration. Um, so I think there, there is a need for making some more robust rules, but I would certainly urge the global community, but I know when I urge the global community on this, I know that this will be water off a duck's back because they're right. never going to listen to this. They like their rules to be so complicated that only some really expensive auditors can even understand them, forget, apply them. So you're reflecting, and, I, and we've certainly seen a lot of you know, uh, critique and skepticism of, of CO2 removal out there uh, in the environmental movement. At the same time, there were some very interesting calls uh, last year and maybe repeated this year that we heard from India, kind of reframing it almost as, it's up to the global north to try to go net negative essentially cleaning up its historic emissions, its past mess. Some even use the frame of decolonizing the atmosphere to allow the global South the ability to, you know, gain the advantages of fossil fuels and, and their emissions for a little longer. And that there, there may be some climate justice equation here in terms of pressing um, de developed countries to push for carbon dioxide removal. Do you, how do you view that reframing in a sense? Do you, do you think it makes any sense? No, I think, Mark, it's a very important and powerful reframing. The fact is, there is no doubt that the global north has overused its share of the atmospheric space. 30% of the global population, including China, uh, Mark, so please be very clear, I include China in the global north now because their emissions have actually out, have, uh, have overtaken uh, most countries. Um, so 30% of the world's population, including China, um, occupy 70% of the global carbon budget up to 2030. I'm talking about up to 2030. Now, what happens to countries like India? What happens to Africa? And therefore, there is definitely a need for much more drastic emission reduction trajectories in the global north, in Europe and in the US and also in China, um, in Australia, in Canada. Now, within that, the role of carbon sequestration, the role of carbon removal, if those countries find that they are able to to do that um, and they can invest money in it and it's actually a viable uh, technology and not one in which we are playing uh, God once again because what the only thing that worries me sometimes when I see um, when I read about these technologies I don't know enough the only thing that you know and this is more philosophical than actual practical marks so forgive me on this Mm -hmm. But my only problem is that we are where we are today because humankind has believed that they can dominate nature and that they have had no, no real um, understanding of the consequences of breaching the planetary boundaries. Now, my only worry with some of the technologies that I read about, I don't know enough about them other than the nature-based solutions, is, you know, if it doesn't make, the, um, uh, the country's more complacent thinking there is a solution out there, right. and therefore we can do what we do without worrying about mitigation. Right. And the other is that we don't play God once again, because I think we need to be much more humble with nature rather than thinking that we'll be able to overcome um, and um, re-engineer nature uh, for our benefit. We are where we are because of the arrogance that we've had. And, and I'll, I'll come back to that, that in, in a moment, because I think it's fundamental uh, in this debate where your ethical framework is and how you place yourself vis-a-vis -vis technology and nature and different forms of you know, taking ethical decisions. Um, and I'll come back to that with regards just very briefly to something else in a second. But basically, even with faster emission cuts and if some form of carbon removal can work at a serious level, it, even with all of that, climate impacts are going to grow more severe in the short to medium term. We already see the evidence of the heat waves uh, in India and, uh, you know, climate stress is all around the world, even at 1.1 to 1.2 degrees warming, as you, as you said. Um, do you see policymakers, including in the global south, doing enough to prepare for this uh, higher level of warming that is coming, uh, whether through adaptation or other additional risk reduction approaches? Do you, do you actually see people getting to grips with the fact that this world is coming? 
you know, Mark, we started our conversation with this. And uh, the fact is, there is no doubt that politicians in my world uh, are very worried. Uh, they can see the impacts. There's no longer only talk of climate change. And we also know that climate change is not the only factor because of which we have such severe consequences. It's always multiple reasons. Yes. It's also the mismanagement of the land and water. It's the lack of development of poor people. And that is exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. So there is worry and you know, no politician can um, in our part of the world, any part of the world, uh, remain immune to this because they, they are responsible to their people. And they are seeing more flooding, they're seeing more drought, they're seeing more heat stress uh, farmers are struggling today, going between more heat and more uh, pest and uh, lack of water. So it's a, it's a very tough time. But whether they are able to rise above all the petty politics of the world and focus on this as the biggest imperative, I would suspect not. I think there is too much to distract them today. There's too much where the media is also not, I mean, I, I just wrote an article saying that, you know, we've reached a point where all these natural disasters have reached the 10th pages of our papers. It's almost like this is the new normal and that mm. life goes on. And yet we know that it's getting worse. We know this is, every year is different. It floods in Bihar, it floods in Assam in India, but this year the flood in Assam has been a six month affair which yes. means that there is so little time for the state to pick up and restart. So, yes. you know, it's, it's, but we do not seem to have that, uh, the, I think society is right now, whether you, you know, you can always say that societies always look for a cop out. They're always looking for an easy way out. And maybe the fear, that's why also Mark, I, I'm a little reluctant to play into this fear. And to keep talking about here's a doomsday, yes. here, yes. here, you know, be fearful, because that only makes people just stop reading, stop focusing on it, saying, right. let's give up. It's never going to improve. Right. And, and I think human beings never want to face up to something when you hold a mirror to them and say, you're going to die. And you, right. you cannot do that. So you but, have to focus on what's the possibility of yes. being able to take action and the need for urgent action. Just in terms of personally, because it can be very difficult for people working in climate to maintain a sense of optimism, hope, agency. And this is a, something that professionals working in this field really struggle with, both for themselves and then to impart it to their audiences. So what do you, how do you navigate that particular challenge, the question of maintaining that? What, what, what philosophies do you turn to to keep you going? Very good question, Mark. I mean, I do feel increasingly when I see the devastation around us that, you know, how should we go on? I mean, it's isn't it all our combined failure? I've been in this for as long as anyone else and been arguing, pushing, uh, and, and, and making the world aware about climate change. And yet it seems that we are almost losing the battle. The mm -hmm. only way we have to go on, Mark, is by and that's the way I do it, is with the sheer philosophy of saying, we have to stay on course, we cannot give up. We have to keep letting the world know that this is serious, it's an existential threat. We have to find answers. And I do believe in humankind's ability to be able to rise above its pettiness, its, its crassness, and to recognize the fact that we are in a crisis that requires us to come together, to work together. And that's what, I, what we do in India. We're looking for answers. We're constantly looking to suggest what needs to be done, because I think that is also, um, that's also part of not giving up. It's, it's part of looking at where's the solution. And that's why all solutions should be on the table, no question about it. But the solutions that um, uh, that we work on, I'm constantly focusing on that to say, okay, let's keep at it. Let's stay on path, but let's be real. And the only thing that really does um, get the worst out in me is when I see people um, uh, just trying to walk and not 
walk the talk. So I think that's really the talk, the talk is the problem that I have. And I, and I think the matters are too serious for us not to be extremely, extremely aware of the need to take urgent action and the action to be real. Well, on that note, uh, Sunita Narayan, thank you so much for being part of CTD Talk. Really appreciate it.